understanding the formula car and opening ceremony of formula imperial 2022 thank you everyone for being here with us today for this ceremony firstly i would like to introduce our organization and formula imperial event imperial society of innovative engineers is a award winner accredited by fmsci and recommended by ministry of new and renewable energy nari government of india isa india is india's biggest e sport and skill based education platform working since 2013 we are associated with mg motors and sis esc esc automotive skill development council isa india is a leading organizer in india for ev skill development e mobility vehicle design and manufacturing events electric vehicle professional certification ev research and publication it is a well known platform among engineering graduates engineering college universities automotive and various sector councils i see it is creating a uniquely innovation ecosystem centered on green mobility and renewable energy imperial formula imperial is a different formula style hybrid electric and electric vehicle design and manufacturing event organized by isa india the event formally known as hybrid vehicle challenge is to design and fabricate a hybrid vehicle or an electric vehicle under isa india design regulations even give the platform to student to demonstrate and prove their creativity and their engineering skills to complete with a form to compete with a formula style vehicle in areas of engineering design overall cost marketability and dynamic performance in comparison to teams from other universities or college around asia asia the event is organized into three different categories which are hybrid electric and combustion we are organizing the formula imperial since last 7 years with 300 plus teams from india and bangladesh with 30000 plus of student participation who have learned a hand on experience by working with a hybrid technology formula imperial hpc highlighted in electronics and print media by top news channels the electric formula category has been introduced in our fourth season of event and the combustion categories have been introduced in our sixth season of event team can allow team are allowed to participate in any of the three categories hybrid electric and combustion So this is all about our organization and Formula Imperial event. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Ashwini Kumar Sharma, Dean Adamas University, and advisor to ISA India to moderate for the event. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you so much, Saloni. Uh, let me know if I am audible and everything is okay. Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah, thank you. So a very good afternoon to all the. Uh, teams who are present with us uh, uh, needless to mention our dignitary for today uh, mr pat clark uh, i am dr ashwini sharma and i am going to host this uh, this uh, event today uh, this event is all about uh, understanding the formula car and uh, specifically on suspension and steering setup of the formula imperial car uh, we have got the world renowned expert in in this field uh, who is none other than uh, mr pat clark and uh, who is uh, chief design, design judge and and what is that good which is actually coming out from the horse's mouth I means uh, it's something which every team member might be excited of so anyway he is a renowned personality who is known to uh, especially youth across the world but uh, still from from our side i'm taking this ritual of introducing you people to uh, mr Black pat clark uh, mr pat clark uh, before emigrating to australia uh, graduated in mechanical engineering he was involved in international karting as vice president and uh, cik with responsibility of technical matters in uh, 1994 while uh, visiting the us on business uh, he attended fsae as advisor as visitor uh, he attended again in 96 as uh, a volunteer and rest uh, what they say is the history recruited as a design judge by carol smith his first event was uh, as judge was in 1999 in united kingdom then he started fsa australia in 2000 and uh, he was involved to help start fsg in 2006 typically he worked up to 
six FS or FSA event each year, which is huge. Uh, he also write an occasional blog on FSG side, Pat's Corner, and maintains a Facebook group, FSA advice and support, which currently has so many members across the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, present into into this uh, this platform. Uh, this is uh, about uh, Mr. Pat Clark, and uh, apart from this initiative, which is Formula Imperial, uh, the youth knows uh, ISI India in terms of uh, getting the relevant things for the for the for the students, especially. So this time they have come up with uh, two very good initiatives that is internships for the students, especially for the third year. And another one is grooming exercises for the students and that is for the employability enhancement. So be, stay tuned. We will be soon launching on those uh, events uh, separately. But right now we are we are trying to uh, go for Formula Imperial. Yeah, so let us let us have the launching ceremony of the event and may i request here mr pat clark to to open the event by saying uh, i declare the event formula imperial open okay i hereby declare that the formula imperial event is now open thank you thank you so much thank you so much and uh, that is how we are. So this is this is it, ladies and gentlemen. That is all about Formula Imperial. Uh, it, it has given a very good understanding as well as very good uh, skills for the students in real time. Whatever may be the branch of engineering they might be in, but one thing is for sure that if you participate in any of such event, because it involves that rigor of maybe six to nine months, to build the vehicle, to race it, and it actually comes into your, your resume when, when you go for the interviews in the final year. And believe me, when you talk about it in that enthusiastic manner, whether you win the race or you lose the race, but when you say to the interviewer, boss, I have done that right in my third year or second year or final year, then these people get impressed and they have more inclination towards you. So it is not only participation here, it's learning as well as reaping the benefits of participation. So with these words, I would now like to invite uh, here onto the stage, uh, uh, Mr. Vinod Gupta, who, who is a founder and president of ISI India to give some word of wisdom. Mr. Vinod, over to you. Thank you, Asuni, sir. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to host this online session with uh, Mr. Pat Clark. He is the uh, chief design judge and mentor to Formula Imperial. And it is, I am very privileged and honored. He agreed to become the mentor to Formula Imperial. And it is something that will ultimately going to help our youth of our country. And on behalf of ISA India, I would like to welcome all of you for this uh, online session. In past eight years, ISA India has become a preferable skill development platform in India, especially in EV sector side. I would like to share one of the news recently we have done. Uh, last year, we ran a pilot project of a six month diploma program of uh, electric vehicle engineering for the fresh graduates and those students are pursuing their final year. And uh, Asmi sir, it is very proud to announce out of 47 students, 36 students has placed in Boss, Hero Electric, Ola Electric, and many such companies. And it's still the journey is going on. And we are starting the new batch very soon from the 1st October. ISI India has also taken 
various initiatives those are leading from the front likewise isa india joined hands with mg motor for the developing center of excellence at various locations of india to imparting knowledge skill development research innovation incubation for the electric mobility sector isa india is also joined with various automotive industries they are supporting us on many fronts in terms of technology in terms of research in terms of intensives in terms of placements and mentorship to our youth of our country it is all about something that the vision to atmanirbhar bharat and we are trying to contribute and we are getting the support from all the directions of our country from the academia side from the industry side from the government side everybody is supporting our platform and that's why we are fortunate enough to say we have skilled more than 2.5 lakh plus people in past 8 years and now isa india is also joining hands with the many universities and colleges stus to start a space license in electric vehicle engineering and i i am very happy to say here this year we have collaborated with the five private universities those who are starting academia partnership program with us and they are taking admission in btech with various core engineering branches specialization in electric vehicle engineering so such kind of things isa india is doing and uh, 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 there is one more thing i would like to share that will be a uh, future aspect for all the engineering graduates and it is going to be a very great platform we have joined hands with the society of manufacturers of electric vehicle smeb and uh, jointly we are developing a digital platform where those people are skilled enough ready to contribute to the industry side they can be directly hired to the ev industry sectors through that platform that platform we are hoping to launch in december this year so by this uh, again i would like to thank mr pat clark who have uh, given his uh, very valuable time and i am hoping this session will be uh, uh, will be a very useful to each and every one and from this i would like to thank you all the participants thank you over to you sir thank you <laughs> thank you mr vinod it's uh, nice to hear that there are so many initiatives being taken by isi india and uh, uh, miles to go but still i think we have uh, crossed the first uh, barrier of tipping the market tipping the market means uh, in students and professionals are now coming along uh, including the universities needless needless to mention so ladies and gentlemen now moving ahead with the the ceremony uh, we would like to have on the dais uh, with the inaugural ad address by uh, by mr pet clark who is uh, going to be chief design judge for formula imperial so uh, mr pet uh, uh, your inaugural address starts now for 3 minutes thank you so I much have, i have no inaugural address um, <laughs> we've already wasted 15 minutes okay. achieving nothing achieving nothing telling telling uh, <laughs> telling us what like how great we are we know we know all of that um the reason why i said earlier that i would probably divide this into two halves is because i suspected this would happen uh, as i said we're 15 minutes in and we've got nowhere and i don't have an inaugural address i have a presentation to give to the students and i'm ready to go whenever you'll turn me loose right so no problem sir uh, let us let us have uh, see this is the ritual or what we can say the tradition from the india side that everything what we do gets celebrated and this is what the celebration is uh, within minutes or so you will be delivering your uh, address today uh, which is a, a webinar on electric mobility uh, especially to suspension design 
Uh, now I would request uh, that uh, quickly uh, Mr. Shubham, who is uh, Director of Mobility Events and Corporate Affairs, uh, can come over and uh, and address the gathering. Gathering as as he has got only again three minutes. Sure, sir. Thank you for your time, sir. And like we are glad to have Mr. Pat Clark over here and accepting our invitation for delivering this wonderful webinar. And uh, we are glad to announce the Formula Imperial 2022. At Formula Imperial 2022, our students can design and manufacture Formula car under three categories, hybrid, electric, and combustion. And all the rules and regulations are designed under the International Formula Student Standards. So uh, like without taking time, I just want to give you the brief about uh, the event schedule, what we have planned. Like we are going to start the registration from 15 September, the phase one registration. And due to this COVID and the lockdown, uh, like every team is facing some problem, the financial problem. So we have minimized our fees and like for the initial, we have kept very low fees. And with that, we are, start, we are following the online assessments and online mentorship program. Then phase two registration report submission, then report submission B, then phase three registration, then team video submission, and then we will be having the final event in July 2022 at both the international circuit. So every team will be receiving the mail regarding the, the event schedule, the rule book in the coming days. So thank you for thank you, sir, for the platform. So we can start with the uh, sorry webinar. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shubham. And uh, now the stage is all yours, uh, Mr. Pet Clark. Uh, you can have your own time to deliberate on number of uh, things which are related to Formula Car. And uh, obviously, the the uh, participants are very very eager to listen to you. So the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, in uh, in my world, we do our celebration afterwards, not before. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks to all of the all, all of the attendees. Um, many of you I've probably met. Um, most of you know me or know who I am. Um, I'm one of these old grey-haired guys who's been around for many years. And uh, fortunately, if I have a skill. It's that I find it very easy to to uh, broach the the generation gap. I have no trouble at all talking across the generations uh, with the students, and uh, and you'll find me easy to talk to. Uh, please don't call me Mr. Pat or call me Mr. Clark or Mr. Pat Clark. I'm just Pat. Okay. Now, before we start, I'm going to just a, a quick little history lesson, because a famous man once told us that. Uh, uh, those who don't learn from the mistakes made in the past are going to repeat them. So we're not going to repeat those mistakes. We're going to start again. Um, firstly, uh, I'm now 76 years of age in, in a, a few, day, few days, or yeah, a few days. Um, so I'm retired, and I've had to cut back the number of events that, uh, that I'm involved with. Um, so these days, I only attend events where I'm either needed or requested or where I can actually be of some general assistance. Um, I have two uh, competitions or, or two areas of interest where I have unfinished business. One of these, of course, is India, and the other one is Russia. Now, Russia's problem is different. It's mainly because it crosses 11 time zones, so it's very very difficult to organize things in Russia with everybody on the same page at the same time. However, India is something different. Uh, some of the senior design judges about 15 years ago, uh, Claude Ruel, Steve Fox from the US, myself and some others, started to get extremely frustrated with the very poor quality of the efforts coming from the Indian teams that we were seeing in uh, in the US, in Germany, and the UK. Uh, we knew that you could do better. So we set out on a mission uh, to improve the quality of uh, student engineering coming from the subcontinent. And we had several false starts. Initially, we, uh, we tried to get involved with the SAE 
and uh, the super event, but for reasons that we don't need to go into here, that didn't work. We then were approached by a company who wanted to run a, an event called Formula Student India, and uh, that too didn't work. Eventually, uh, the Formula Bar Rat event came along, and we've been involved, or I've been involved, with the Formula Bar Rat event now since its inception. And it's been a very successful and very tidy little event. However, obviously, for, uh, the, the Imperial Formula is a much bigger event and, and probably much more, uh, uh, well, a, a, a bigger event with more involvement in the country. So when I was, in, when I was asked to be involved, I said, sure, sure, let's see how it goes. Okay. Um, today, before, again, before I start, I'm going to tell you one or two facts of life. Because the pandemic has thrown a, 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 yeah, a spanner in the works, as they say, thrown a spanner in the works, uh, it means that effectively for many teams, they're just starting again. There's been a break in the continuity of, of knowledge and design. And as a result, we have many teams that we can really consider first time teams, uh, you know, raw teams that really have no real idea where they're going. OK, I'm a great believer in, in rules of three, and I'm going to tell you the very first one now. In motorsport, you can have fast, reliable, or inexpensive. Only two of those. You cannot have all three. Certainly not at, at our level. If you have a fast and reliable car, it is not going to be inexpensive. It's going to be very expensive. If you have a fast and inexpensive car, it's not going to be reliable. If you have a fast and, uh, sorry, an inexpensive, an ex inexpensive and reliable car, it's not going to be very fast. So the first decision that a new team must make is which of those three points are they going to sacrifice? Let's talk about it. You can't sacrifice inexpensive because you've got no money. No team that I ever met ever had enough money. So until you can establish that you have a budget to do it properly, you cannot abandon the inexpensive side of the triangle. Second thing is, no team ever got together and said, hey, we're going to design and build a Formula Imperial car, and we're going to go to the competition, and we're going to drive around four laps and then the chain breaks, and we'll watch the rest of the event from the side. So the second one you can't abandon is reliability. You, everybody wants to be there at the finish, to take the checkered flag, to be at the award ceremony, to party with their uh, peers, and to be able to put onto their resume uh, that they have completed, successfully completed, a Formula Student event, a Formula Imperial event, whatever we like to call it. That leaves fast. You don't need to be fast, okay? That's the one you abandon. So put out of your mind that you're going to build a rocket ship Formula One car and you're going to scream around the racetrack and become, you know, the next Lewis Hamilton or, or, or Max Verstappen. That isn't going to happen. OK, it is more important to finish. It is more important to complete the, the project because Formula Student is a an educational exercise. It is not a motorsport exercise. Motorsport is the theme. But the actual intent is to teach you young graduates uh, the practical application of engineering and business applications and, uh, uh, you know, how to uh, how to to approach the board for for funding, how to uh, how, how to how to operate in business. This is why, as the good doctor pointed out, uh, formula student graduates are so welcome in business. In many, many places, there are uh, companies who tell us that when they advertise for a job, the first split from the applications is, have they done a Formula Student event or not? If they haven't, they go into the second class pile. OK, move along a little bit. Today, I'm not going to really talk about powertrain. I'm not going to talk about uh, electric vehicles or, or combustion vehicles or or uh, hybrid vehicles, apart from saying that realistically a brand new team with no knowledge has really only got one choice, and that choice is a simple IC car. 
uh, electric cars are much more expensive and much more difficult, and hybrid cars are even more difficult, more electric, more uh, 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 expensive, well, more expensive, but also uh, more complicated. So the, I know there are reasons, uh, you know, your, uh, your university may decree that, you know, you build an electric car or nothing. Well, OK, then you build an electric car. But my advice would be to start off. The intent of formula student or formula imperial is not to save the planet. Saving the planet's lovely. I have no problems with that. But the intent of formula imperial is to educate your young graduates. That's what we're intending to do. Okay, another one of Pat's rules of three. There are three things that you need to have a formula student team. One is you need people. Second thing is you need money. And the third thing is that you need time. Now, if you haven't got enough people, that's easy to fix. There's a billion people in India. I'm sure you can find some more. If you haven't got enough money, that's a little bit more difficult to fix. However, let me tell you, there is money and sponsorship available in India. I'll come back to that in a second. The big thing is time. If anything is more important than anything else in a formula student project, it is management of time, project management. Realistically, the clock starts ticking and it doesn't stop. It doesn't wait for you. As the late Carl Smith used to say, the race starts at three o'clock. If you're not ready, well, that's okay. The race starts at three o'clock. Uh, I should also point out that if, if you have some deadlines and you miss a deadline, you miss a deadline by a day, that's actually two days. Why do I say that? Well, you've lost a day, that one's gone, and now you're going to waste another day catching up to where you would have been if you hadn't lost the day. So you've lost two days. And it just incrementally increases until eventually you're at the event. The event starts at three o'clock and you haven't filled your suspension yet. Um, you know, so your whole year's work goes down the drain. So management of the time is much, much, much more important. Now, you can't get more time, but by clever um, management of how you run the time, you can actually make more use of, of the time. For instance, I see teams making their own steering wheel. And I think, why the heck would you do that? You know, you had to go down to the car parts shop to buy your quick release steering wheel removal hub. Why didn't you just buy a steering wheel while you were there? That then releases the time and the design effort and people that would have been messing around making a steering wheel to do some other job, which is probably more important. Another rule of three. In this time-saving business, um, anything that's not on the car, firstly, it can't break. Secondly, it didn't cost anything. And thirdly, it doesn't weigh anything. So if it doesn't need to be there, don't put it there, which takes to the next step. You know, we see very complicated constructions with push rods and bell cranks and all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. Does that stuff need to be on the car? Not at all. Not at all. All that just adds complication, wastes design time, wastes money because you're buying extra bits and parts and pieces. So, okay, having said all that, let's start talking about what we're going to do here. Okay. One of the things that happens is that we get advice from people that I call druids. Now, I don't know if you know what a druid is, but a druid is effectively a witch doctor. Old time, uh, old time uh, guru or wise man. But like many of those old time gurus and wise men, they actually didn't know anything, but they knew that you didn't know anything. So what they proposed to tell you actually didn't really matter, wasn't the truth anyway. We have too many gurus. We talk about, you know, the suspension, geometry, and all that sort of stuff. Well, I'm no guru. I tell you how it is straight. Uh, there is more time and effort and brain power wasted 
in designing suspension geometry and steering geometry and Ackerman and all these other weird, wonderful things that really don't matter. I'll come back to that in, in due course. OK. Uh, for beginning teams, it's important when you're talking to each other or you're talking to the judges or you're talking to potential advisors or, uh, or sponsors that you can talk the talk and, uh, and you understand the language. There are some words used sometimes in industry which is not used in motorsport and there are some words used in India which are not used in other places. Um, I understand, for instance, that uh, in the Indian language, that the word for tube and the word for pipe is the same. But let me assure you, you don't make your car out of pipe. You make your car out of tube because that's something different. Pipe is for transporting gases or fluids, and it's described by the internal diameter. Tube is for structural purposes, the stuff that we use. And it's described by its outside diameter and its wall thickness. Another uh, thing we hear often, the, the, uh, the steering element in the front of a car, described as a knuckle. Uh, that's not a term that's used in motorsport. Uh, the terms in motorsport is an upright or an upright finger. So when I talk about uprights, I guess I'm talking about steering knuckles. So you need to keep that in mind, but we'll talk about like the basic ones. First of all, we've got wheelbase. Okay, now the wheelbase is literally the measurement of the car from be between the axles, the length of the car between the axles. And there is a rule in the rule book that uh, is a minimum, minimum wheelbase. Uh, and many teams will actually struggle to actually build the car down to that minimum wheelbase, thinking that the only reason there is a rule there is because obviously shorter is better. Well, that's not actually the case. And we see many designs that have been badly compromised by trying to move the wheels too close together, and they've introduced uh, undesirable angles in the steering geometry in the front of the car, or in the drive shaft geometry in the back of the car, or they've spoiled the front to rear uh, weight balance of the car. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to design your car, but I will give you some good hints along the way. And the first one I'll toss in right now. A good point to aim for in a Formula student car, front to rear weight balance, is the car should be about 40% front, 60% rear weight balance. Okay. That obviously means some things down the road in design with springs and suspension geometry and whatever. But you should aim for the car in ready to race condition that's driver in place, full of fuel, with 60% uh, of its weight on the back axle. Okay. If wheelbase is the length of the car, the track width is the, uh, is the width of the car. Okay, there is also a rule on track, not on track width so much, but on the, uh, on the difference between the front and rear track. Uh, we have had cars fall over because the track has been too narrow. But in any case, you will always build your car with the rear track a little bit narrower than the front track. Why? Because when you drive around a cone, the rear wheels will run on a tighter radius than the front wheels. And the rear wheel, if you just miss the cone with the front wheel, guaranteed you will hit it with the rear wheel. Okay, so you need to need to ensure that um, you know that, that you can that you can miss the wheel. Okay, um, camber, static camber, that's the angle at which the wheels stand up and down. Okay, it should be adjustable because you're not really going to know what the best camber for your tire is going to be until you actually get the car running on the track and you can do some testing. That's another thing that comes into the time management. You need to get the car finished in time to test. Nobody is going to finish a car, take it to the event, and have a drivable and uh, competitive car without testing and evaluating and fixing the things that break, because I promise you things will break. 
if you consider that, you know, the Mercedes Formula One team have about 1,200 workers in their team, they can't take a car to the first test session of the year without having things break or have to be re-engineered or re-machined. So why do you think that 15 university students in India are going to be able to do better? It doesn't work that way. The car will break. It'll break for all sorts of reasons. The problem that you've got, and this is another point you should jot down and write down, it's not what you don't know. What you don't know, you can actually learn by reading the appropriate books or emailing Pat or, or whatever it is you do. The problem is what you don't know that you don't know. Uh, you know, in other words, you're acting in a design vacuum. You've got no idea where you should be going or what you should be doing or, you know, that's that's what only comes with, with experience. And what will happen is that part of the way through the design of your car, you're going to realize that you have made some decisions based on incorrect information and you've actually made some mistakes. Now comes a critical point where what do you do? Do you stop and go back and start again? Whoops, hang on a minute. We got the time management thing. Do you sort of work around it and try to get finished? Or do you just keep going and doing what you're doing? Um, I can't really give you the answer to that because you have to figure it out for yourself. But whatever you do, remember those deadlines. You have to make the deadlines. Okay. Camber, when you get the car on the track, uh, your correct camber will be will be dictated by the tire temperatures. Um, you should measure tires when they're hot, come off the track. Um, I don't like the use of a uh, an infrared thermometer to measure tires. That only measures the uh, the radiated heat from the surface of the tire. I really want to know what the temperature in the uh, in the the tread compound actually is, and that requires a pyrometer with a needle, like a needle probe. And you can usually buy those as an adapter that goes on to a multimeter, so you actually read. The, uh, the degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit as uh, millivolts or whatever on the multimeter. Um, basically, you should measure the, the tread in three places across the tread, on the outside edge, in the middle, and on the inside edge. The inside edge should be the hottest. We'll call that 100%. The middle of the tread should be about 90% of that, and the outside edge should be about uh, another 10% less again. So, you know, about, about you know, 85 or 90%. The actual temperature, I can't tell you because the actual um, temperature. Hello, sir. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Hello, sir. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Is this possible that you can share your PPT on screen? I it, I will do that, but I haven't actually got to the point where I'm sharing PPTs yet. <laughs> let me just let me just uh, let me just find how do I do that? Open share tree. What's that do? There we go. What have we got now? What have I done? What have I done? Okay, now I've opened my share tray. Now I want to show that window. Oh, there we go. You can see this. Yes, sir. OK, let me just blow that up. OK, I'm going to find that. Goods. OK. Wheelbase we talked about. Track we talked about. Camber we're talking about. Uh, numbers there if you wish to take them. Uh, general camber range used in a former student is from about zero to two degrees negative uh, range of camber. Always always negative, never positive camber on a former student car. Uh, static camber measured like so. Okay, uh, steering axis is the line about which the step axle steers. Now, steering axis. Oops. Yeah, okay. 
steering axis is the vertical axis through the top and bottom outer ball joints. In other words, the angle that the uh, that the steering upright or steering knuckle pivots through. And it should be very close to being uh, to being vertical because it actually has an effect on camber change when the car is steered. Um, so the steering axis inclination will move the wheel camber towards positive when the wheel is steered. So that's not really what you want. As I said, you don't want positive uh, camber on a formless student on the steered wheels. Fortunately, caster does the opposite, and usually we have much more caster than we, than we do have uh, steering axis. But OK, now scrub radius is the offset. Let's just have a look here. So there you can see on this picture that the the, uh, the scrub radius. We don't drop scrub, back, but uh, we can only see your first slide. My first slide. Yeah, Why that only. I, um, I don't know. Well, I'm not on the first slide. Let me tell you, I'm way down. Um, I've got no idea why. Yeah, it's visible now. I think uh, the non slide show view would be fine. Uh, OK. What do you see there? Yeah, now we see the steering axis inclination slide. OK, I'm just going to leave it on that. I'm just going to leave it on that slide because if that works better, that's. Um, that, that helps me. OK, so we're talking about steering axis inclination. So the line, the inner line, this, can you see my arrow? Yeah, yeah, we can. OK, yeah, so th this line down here, that's the steering, that's the line around which the wheel is going to steer. Um, the steer, steering axis inclination, that's, that's what it steers around. But when we go to the next slide, you'll see that here, the Higher center line, I'll come back to it. It's not actually the center line, but there is a little offset here. And that's actually, we call that scrub radius. So the scrub radius is measured from where the steering axis intersects the ground and the center of pressure of the tire. Now, 5,000 times I've seen it written down that scrub radius is measured from where the steering axis hits the ground to the center line of the tire. But it's not the center line of the tire. It's the center of pressure. It's where the force is applied. Now, if a, a little bit of steering axis is actually, or steering offset sometimes called, is actually a good thing. You know, about, say, 50 millimeters or something like that. If you get too small, what can often happen is that the tire distorts under cornering force and the center of pressure actually goes underneath the uh, the scrub radius, and as a result, your steering uh, your steering offset, your scrub radius goes negative, and that's not a good thing. Okay, a little bit of scrub radius is a good thing because it gives the driver a little bit of work to do. Formula student cars are very light, so when the driver steers this, this is going to lift the car up a little bit when he steers inside or outside. That's what gives the self-centering to the steering. But it also gives the driver a little bit of work to do. In other words, something to kind of push against. If your steering axis is too, uh, offset is too great, your scrub radius is too great, the work for the driver becomes way too big and he gets tired after a few laps and uh, tired drivers don't go fast. Am I back online? Yeah. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. I don't know what happened there. Somebody must have cut the wire. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so we're talking now about caster. So caster is actually the angle of the front upright or the 
top and bottom ball jump when when viewed from the side. And caster is very important. Okay, it's very important for a couple of reasons. But the uh, most important thing is that it gives the car self-centering straight line stability, but it also gives us a change in uh, both camber and in corner weights when the car is steered. If you look at this, you can see that when that wheel is steered, as it turns out, it's going to go down. When it's turned in, it's going to go up. So that actually gives the car a diagonal weight transfer, uh, which makes the car unbalanced like a, like a chair with one short leg. But that actually can help the car corner. I mean, that's how go-karts actually get around corners, by having this diagonal weight transfer, which can be a very useful tool for uh, for uh, for us in the in the form of student caster angles normally you'd look at a caster angle from about plus two to plus five something like that uh, one thing that can happen is that sometimes the choice of kin of caster angle for kinematic reasons i'm talking here about uh trying to uh, use the camber change caused by caster steer to do other things, or the uh, the weight the diagonal weight transfer caused by caster to do other things. Uh, sometimes this can result in this caster trail being too great, and the load on the driver's wrist again becomes too heavy. Same as excessive scrub radius becomes too heavy, and the driver. The, the, the car can't be steered accurately and the driver gets tired. Okay, what can be done is to make the front suspension upright with the front axle not in line with the top and bottom ball joint. In this case, it's been moved forward a little bit and that has reduced the caster trail. So, so it's that once again, uh, your screen is still not visible. Uh, your screen is not shared, I guess. Okay, uh, okay, this, uh, let me just go back to where we were. Oh, the share tray. Is it visible now? Can you see it now? No, sir. Not yet, sir. Ah, um, mm, mm, yes, okay. I have no idea what's going on here. Um, I'm looking at open the share, open the share tray. You should be able to see that. Yeah, yeah, it's visible now. Now we can see it. Yeah, this is certainly a buggy program, isn't it? Okay. What I'm what I'm talking about here is you can see, in this case, unlike this one, where the axle is on line with the top and bottom uh, ball joints, in this case, the axle the 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 caster angle is actually increased. But this, the the caster trail has decreased because the the um, axle has actually been made ahead of that line, the the pivot line. Um, that's quite common. You see that a lot on motorcycles, where if you have a look at the bottom of the forks, that the the front axle goes through in front of the fork, not at the bottom of the fork. Um, so that actually reduces the steering effort, but still gives you the camber change. That you're looking for with a, with a high cam with a high as a result of a high caster angle. Okay, toe in and toe out. Everybody talks and loves toe in and toe out. Okay, uh, for those who for those who don't know the term or don't understand the term, wheels on a car don't roll parallel with the uh, with the car on the ground. Um, it is usual to have them pointing inwards a little bit or pointing outwards a little bit. Uh, usually on street cars, the front wheels are towed in just a little bit. That is to say, they, the front of the wheels are closer together than the back of the wheels. Uh, not the case with a Formula student car. With a Formula student car, invariably the front wheels will be towed out a little bit, say three millimeters the three millimeters being the difference between the measurement across the front of the wheels and the measurement across the back of the same wheel measured up at axle height. Uh, why do we do that? Well, to explain it in simple terms, 
if you can imagine you're riding a bicycle down the road with your friend. So you're two people riding bicycles beside each other. Okay. And they both lean over towards each other a little bit. What's going to happen? They're going to run into each other and collide. Okay. So if you turn the front wheel away from the other bike, uh, you're still going to go straight down the road, but now there is actually a waste of energy because where's the energy going that's trying to push the bikes together? Um, and this is in, within the chassis. We're, hold, we're forcing them apart with a chassis in the car that's holding them apart. So we actually have a scrub and we cancel that scrub by towing the wheels out, steering them away from each other a little bit. So front toe out about three millimeters. Now, we don't want toe out at the rear of the car. Toe out at the rear of the car will make for an extremely unstable car, particularly under brakes when the, when the driver is braking. So at the back of the car, you want about three millimeters of toe in. I'll come to rear toe in just a moment. Okay. Here I have a description of how the toe is measured. So you've got dimension X, which is the measurement from the middle of the tires across the front. Dimension Y is the middle of the tires across the back. And the amount of toe should be dimension Y minus dimension X equals the amount of toe, in this case, on the front of the car. All right, um, here we have a couple of nasty little things that creep in, and that's bump steer and roll steer. Now, what this is all about is if the suspension linkage permits the wheels to steer back or front when the suspension operates, and this is usually caused by the steering linkage not being, um, not being balanced with the suspension linkage. Um, so in other words, as the suspension moves up, the wheel might tow out. As the suspension moves down, the wheel might tow in, or in fact, it might tow out in both directions, or might tow in in both directions. Depends on, on what's going on. Now, this will make the car extremely difficult to drive, because every time the wheel moves or the driver goes to change, the driver's trying to steer the car from the steering wheel, and the car's trying to steal the car from the, uh, from the, um, from, from the suspension geometry. Now, a little bit of bump steer on the front is not such a huge deal because the driver has the steering wheel and he can actually correct it a little bit. But bump or roll steer at the rear of the car is a disaster because that's just, uh, the driver's just chasing the car all over the track. Cannot go fast, cannot, uh, cannot drive smoothly and uh, you know, it, it's it's a, a dynamic situation that makes it almost impossible for them to drive. Okay, here we're talking about bump steer. We have a steering rack, and you can see on one side the steering arm is long, and on the other side the steering arm is short, and the rack is not in the middle of the car. So what happens? Okay, when this wheel hits a bump, that wheel is going to tow in because this ball joint travels through a tighter angle than the, than the suspension does. And the opposite is on the, the outside. So if you hit a bump, this car would actually, if you hit a two wheel bump, this car would dive immediately to the left because both wheels would steer to the left and the driver has put no input in the steering wheel at all. Okay. Um, now, okay. Yeah, shown here, the, the effect is shown here. Um, these pictures are still showing up? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm getting a bit nervous. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, you can see the, we're talking now about I just didn't realize, but we've actually skipped onto yes, Ackerman. Sir. Okay. Uh, okay, Ackerman. Ackerman is an angle usually incorrectly described because we don't care what the Ackerman is. What we're after is the effect of Ackerman. And the effect of Ackerman is to change the actual steering angle 
on the front wheels as the suspension, as the steering is operated. Usually we want the inside wheel to turn more than the outside wheel, because after all, the inside wheel has to turn around a tighter radius than the outside wheel. But at the speed that we're hopefully going in the, uh, in the Formula Student car, we should have uh, we should have uh, some slip angles. So, you know, it's not like a train going around the track. Um, we actually do need some slip angles. So, Ackerman is not important. Ackerman is another thing that's um, that's talked about by the Druids. Personally, if I were designing a car, I would probably put no Ackerman in it at all, or maybe a little bit of positive Ackerman, and then I would tune it out on the track by changing the static toe. I mean, instead of having maybe three millimeters of toe out at the front, I might have five millimeters of toe out at the front or two millimeters of toe out at the front because I can fine tune the amount of, of uh, Ackerman needed. How do you determine whether you have enough or too much? Well, again, that comes from, um, from measuring the temperature of the tires, especially after you've turned circles like in the skid pan event. Um, you should be able to see if the inside wheel is dragging itself sideways across the track, that's too much Ackerman, or is pushing the outside wheel across the track, which is not enough Ackerman. Uh, it's important probably for you to, to do some diagrams and uh, some force diagrams and actually kind of work out in your head what, what's actually happening, what's actually going on. So that you know what to look for when you when you're going to try tune your car to make it to make it travel properly. Okay, I'm now going from Ackerman, and I'm going to talk about rear toe control. And this lousy rear wheel control, rear toe control, is probably the biggest single mistake that we see in Formula Student cars again and again and again. Um, unbelievable that you can uh, you can preach to teams until you're blue in the face, and you come back to the next year's competition, and guess what? They're the same again. Uh, usually, rear toe is controlled by either a separate toe control link, this link here, or what's called a Z bar, which is really the toe link. It's a, it's a, a wishbone with another, with another link. But what's important is that you have, a, first of all, a, a good load path, almost right angles into the chassis. And secondly, that your toe base is wide enough to support the, uh, to support the forces. Uh, it's, uh, often we see the, 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 uh, the toe link is connected to the middle of an unsupported chassis tube, where the chassis tube can, can flex and, and allow rear toe. Or we see the toe control, well, I think I've got a picture. Yeah, often we see this sort of thing. Here, the toe link is not at right angles and the toe base is way too short. That car is going to steer in the back every time it hits a bump. And here we see that the toe control is actually being fed into uh, the arm of the wishbone. Like It would have been far better to move that down there a bit and feed it into this point here. Uh, in the, both these cases, the, you are often able, with, and as judges we do this, we actually squat down beside that wheel and we show the team how we can actually steer the rear wheel just with our hands. We find it's not very, very, uh, not very difficult to do. Uh, another thing that helps control the rear toe is, I haven't actually shown it there, but here, that's, that's a picture from a Delara Indy car, and you can see how important they take toe control. See, nice wide toe base, and the toe control is fed at right angles into the chassis. This stuff is vitally important. Now, remember back when we were talking, do we talk about that down here? Oh, we'll get down to it. Remember when I was talking about the front about a scrub radius? When you're designing the back of the car, you should aim for zero scrub radius because the scrub radius is actually the moment arm that causes the rear toe to change. So if you take the force away, then you're going to have less, less uh, problems with the rear wheel steering on the car. Okay, what's the next one? 
static camera. We talked about static camera. Move along a little bit. I've said here that radial ply tires require more negative camber than bias ply tires. A good starting point for camber is two, minus two front, minus two rear, maybe a bit more. Sometimes with I've seen uh, cars with uh, Michelin radial tires running seven degrees of negative camber on the front. Uh, that's an enormous amount of camber. So. OK. I've said here, remember that the camber angle is going to change as the suspension operates and as the steering wheel is turned. Now, often teams don't understand this, but a question that you will often be asked by the design judge is this one. If we're to take your car in the workshop and we sit it on a level table on four scales, and then ask with, with the driver sitting in it, and let's say for talk's sake that the the weight on the scales is reading 50 pounds on each front scale and six, sorry, 50 kilos on each front scale and 60 kilos on each rear scale. Just the value that what the number is doesn't matter. And then we ask the driver to turn the steering wheel hard to the left. What do you think will happen on the scales? A, nothing. B, the outside will get heavier or the inside will get heavier. What's going to happen? There, remember, there are no dynamic forces being applied here at all. Well, what happens is that the caster KPI twins will force the wheel that's turning inwards down and will force the tire, that, sorry, that's like the wheel that's on the inside of the corner down. So that will make that scale read heavy. The wheel on the outside will move upwards, so the wheel will go light. So let's say for talk's sake, that the front wheel on the inside goes from 50 kilos to 60 kilos, and the wheel on the outside goes from 50 kilos to 40 kilos. Now, what happens on the scales on the back of the car? Well, you would expect that that weight transfer would be the same on the back, that the, that the, the, the diagonal weight transfer would make the, uh, the inside rear wheel heavier and the outside rear wheel lighter. Sorry, other way around. Inside rear wheel lighter, outside rear wheel heavier. That doesn't necessarily always happen uh, because if the chassis is not stiff enough to resist the torsion that you're applying on the car, uh, then uh, that diagonal weight jacking won't occur and the chassis will flex. That's the reason why we want chassis to have good torsional stiffness. And again, if you've got your pencils and papers, I'll give you a number. I want to see a torsional stiffness in the chassis measured from wheel to wheel, not just the chassis, but the suspension. So you remove the springs from the chassis and fit solid rods, and then measure from hub to hub, back to front, apply a force. And I want to see a, uh, a, 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 a chassis stiffness, torsional stiffness of one order of magnitude greater than the roll stiffness, the suspension roll stiffness in the car. That's a good base mark. It's not too difficult to achieve. Um, so that's that's a number that. So uh, the point I guess I was getting to is that it's it's not just bumps that make your suspension and steering articulate. Just simply steering the car is going to do that too. A judge may well ask you that in the competition about the weight transfer on the scouts. Okay, let's see where we are. Never mind. We'll close down and open up. Excuse me, folks.
Right, okay, we're talking about capital. Right, let's talk about this. Okay. Dynamic camera change. So we were talking about static camera. That's how you set the camera to start with. Now we're going to talk about camera that happens uh, when the suspension operates. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, a, a, a typical four-link suspension, double wishbone suspension. Uh, there is a, an instant center inboard here somewhere. Generally, I like the virtual swing axle length, which is basically the, the length of this axle, to be much longer than this. But it's drawn at that size, so it'll fit on the, on the slide. But normally I would like that instant center to be way out here somewhere. Maybe twice the track width or something like that. Try to get the bottom suspension links parallel to the ground and as long as practical. That's so that there is less scrub generated at the tire surface patch as the suspension operates and to keep your tires happy. So in this case, the camera will go more negative in bump and less negative in bump. So what happens is we, the, the, as the wheel bumps up, this arm angles in more than does this one, and as a result, we will generate more camber like that, and the virtual sway excellent gets much smaller, gets much shorter. Okay, when it droops, okay, this engine will fall down. The uh, instant center moves away again, and the camera goes positive. Now, the rules require that the car has 50 millimeters of suspension travel, 25 millimeters up and 25 millimeters down. Uh, don't exceed that unless you have to. Uh, if, if the um, if the suspension travel is limited, very little, very little bad thing can happen with camber change or jacking or anything else. So you limit the suspension to a minimum that the, the rules require you to limit it to. Uh, Colin Chapman, the famous car designer, once said years ago, any suspension will work if you don't let it work. And so that's what he's talking about. I mean, you know, you just need you need enough suspension to pass the rules and to keep your tires happy. You're not building a limousine uh, with this soft flush suspension. And uh, you also have to remember, of course, that you want to build the car as low as possible. Uh, because obviously keeping the center of gravity as low as possible is a good thing. But you don't want the car to hit the ground because if the car hits the ground, you'll get a black flag in the event. Now, one of the problems that you have is that what's good suspension geometry for cornering is not really good, or like when the car rolls, is not really good suspension geometry for, um, for braking. And I have a little, let's just see if I can make these work. Okay. Ooh. Are we back again? Hello? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, let me know if you can see this. No. Can you no. see that? No, no shit. Oh. So that's not showing on the screen. Oh, no. Nope. No, sir. Okay. okay. 
what it, what it is, it's it's a, an animation that actually shows the wheels are moving up and down. And the geometry is such that the wheels are kept pretty well straight. So in other words, that gives good break, good uh, good grip to the tires on braking and on acceleration. But the compromise is that when we go to rolling the car, it actually rolls the wheels out into positive and negative camber as it rolls. Um, it uh, the animation, unfortunately, when I go to full screen on on here, the animation doesn't. Well, you can't see it. But however. As I've said, the front of the tire should be straight up and down and braking in negative camber uh, and when braking. It's straight up and down and braking in negative camber on the outside when turning when the chassis rolls. But in reality, the opposite is happening. A saving grace is the camber change caused by the caster when it's steering. Remember that business of the of the caster causing uh, camber to change as you steer the car. Uh, right. Okay, this is basically talking about the um, so here. The rules require a minimum of fifty millimeters of usable suspension travel. How much camber change can that limited travel produce? That's what I'm talking about. Limit the camber, the, the wheel travel to the minimum required or the maximum, well, to a maximum of the minimum required by the rules. Now, the thing is that you need to keep the camber angles within the operating parameters of the chosen tire. The tire data or testing will show you that a certain tire, it might work between zero camber and negative four. Okay. So you set it at negative two so that it never gets out of that window from zero to negative four or whatever that window is. You just choose something in the middle as your static setting. OK. So there are several ways to avoid camber loss caused by chassis roll. One is to raise the roll axis. Second is to increase the ride spring rate. And the third is to use anti-roll devices. OK. Raising the roll axis is something I would never do. Uh, that just uh, the, the car is going to start jacking and you'll have all sorts of issues. So increase the ride spring rate. OK, you can do that. But what's going to happen if you do that is that you're going to. Uh, irritate if that's the right word. Excite is probably a better word. Excite the rubber in the contact patch of the tire to ground. You're going to feed vibrations through there that will cause it to uh, to reduce reduce the tires grip. So uh, a non compliant spring rate will reduce the actual mechanical grip of the car on the road. So you're better off to use some anti roll devices, an anti roll bar or uh, a third some some system to to present prevent roll, which we I'm will look at. Up, but your screen is still not visible. Your slides are not being shared right now. Uh, yeah, let's try again. OK. Do, 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 do. Can you see it now? Yep, yep. OK. OK, somewhere they must be falling into the ocean, somewhere between Australia and India. <laughs> we might have to try a different program next time. OK. You want to talk about roll centers? OK, first cab off the rank. I don't believe in roll centers or roll axis. How about that for a, a statement? People go gaga about roll centers. When I go to design suspension, I will, as I said before, I make the bottom link as long as possible and parallel to the ground. And that's going to ensure that the roll center, if we're going to take any importance to it, is going to be somewhere between the ground and an extended line on the on the uh, on the uh, from the bottom wishbone. It doesn't matter what the geometry we work it all out to be. And the other thing is that once the car is rolling and the suspension is acting, you don't think for one minute that the roll center stays there. The geometric roll center rolls all over the all over the place. Uh, 
One of the old time judges from years ago was a guy by the name of um, Bill, what was his name? Let me just find his name. I've got to find his name. Bill Mitchell, that's what it is. Okay, William H. Mitchell. And Bill Mitchell wrote one of the very first suspension geometry programs that you could run on your computer. It was a program called Racing by the Numbers. And Bill was very, very strong on these kinematic roll centers and, and the, the effects of them. And then many years later, Unfortunately, Bill is no longer with us. He, he passed away a few years ago. He wrote a new paper, and in that new paper, he apologized for all the pe to all the people that had led down the wrong path, talking about roll centers, and he started to talk about force-based roll centers. So you should Google a paper by William H. Mitchell called Force-Based Roll Centers, and that will teach you lots and lots and lots about what actually happens to the wheels and the unsprung mass and the roll axis and all the other things jacking in the real world, not this druid stuff about roll centers and roll axis and whatever. Okay, that's Bill Mitchell, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L. -L. And, well, William H. Mitchell was his name, that's the name. And the paper you should find the paper should be pretty easily available on Google. You should be able to find that. Force-based roll centers. Okay. Right. <laughs> druids. Beware of the druids. Yeah. As I've said, this is real druidism. Okay. I said here that the roll axis geometrically defined axis around which the vehicle will roll when a lateral load is applied. What a load of nonsense. That's not the truth at all. That is not the truth at all. One thing I will say, though, is that the idea of a roll center as the initial design point is actually not a bad idea for a starting point for design. But once you start to expand the design and uh, you start okay. to see what the car is going to do dynamically, it, uh, it doesn't really mean much at all. Another little war story I can tell you is one of the English design judges, a very well-known Formula One and sports car designer, a guy by the name of Tony Southgate. Tony's last uh, design of note was the Jaguar sports car that won the Le Mans 24-hour race a few years ago. Tony went to Ferrari as chief, design, chief designer in the sports car team. And when he got there, he... Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, you're on. Yes. Yeah, the strange noise is happening in the background, that's all. Anyway, Tony Southgate went to Ferrari to design their sports cars. And when he got there, he, this is the days before computer design. When he got there, he was told that Enzo Ferrari had decreed that all Ferraris would have the front roll center midway between the two front wheels and on the ground. And Tony said, oh, no, hang on a minute. And they said, no discussion. That's that's the rule here. OK, so he shrugged his shoulders and uh, proceeded to design the suspension. And very quickly, the roll center moved away from on the ground and moved somewhere else. Uh, Mr. Ferrari came around to inspect the drawing, see how it's going saw what Tony was up to, tapped him on the shoulder and said, Bella, Bella, good, very good. And that was when Tony woke up. He realized that the idea of putting the roll center on the ground between the front wheels was Mr. Ferrari's way of ensuring that the designers didn't start stuffing around, wondering about, oh, will we do this or will we do that? He made them put the pencil on paper. Uh, no. 
Hello, we're back on again. Yep. Who? Is it possible that we're having dropouts because we have too many attendees in the meeting? Because it's getting it's getting extremely frustrating what's happening here. Hello, uh, yes, I can you Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, yes, sir. OK, we'll get it going again. Um, yeah, before we do this again, I think we need to be able to attend to all these issues. OK, uh, as I said, the roll axis is supposed to be lying on a roll on a line between front and rear roll center, but Druidism, that's the Druids. OK. Um, couple of pictures here. If the roll axis or the roll center or whatever is too high, causing jacking. Your screen's not showing. Oh, the screen's not showing. OK, let's try again. OK, can you see it now? Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, do you like that rear wheel? OK, that's caused that's ex extreme jacking caused by the rear roll center or the rear roll axis being too high. And of course, that car will fall over. That's you certainly don't want that sort of stuff to happen on a formula student car. Does it happen on a formula student car? Sure does. Look at the angles on those rear wheels. Again, you'll see that the suspension geometry on this car is very short roll. Uh, oh, very short um, uh, swing axle length, high roll center, high roll axis, and so this car is sticking its back, its bum up in the air as it's jacking in the corner. And also note the amount of understeer that that's generating. So that is not a fast car. Okay. Uh, okay, I talk here about the ride rate. Um, you know, people talk about spring rates. The spring rate's not important. It's actually the ride rate. The ride rate is actually the spring rate, which is multiplied or divided by uh, whatever uh, progression is designed into the suspension geometry. Uh, normally, suspension geometry will be linear. That's to say uh, the first inch of wheel travel will result in the same spring force as the second inch or third inch, or it may be progressive, which means that the spring gets progressively stiffer, or it may be digressive, which means it gets softer. Certainly don't want digressive. Um, uh, progressive is probably not a bad idea because it restricts the rolling of the car, uh, but something close to, uh, to a linear range. Now, this doesn't come about by having uh, springs with um, variable rate springs. This can come about through just simply the geometry, the, you know, the, the geometry of the, the suspension geometry. What happens as the as the suspension operates through the uh, uh, through the spring and, and, and damper arrangement. Uh, one of the funds of, of designing your suspension in the first place. Uh, OK. Now we talked about before about anti-roll devices. So I've said anti-roll devices are usually springs or torsion bars connected in such a way as to resist chassis roll whilst having no effect on the suspension ride rate. So in other words, there are springs that operate across the car. Um, as I said, usually they're U-shaped torsion bars, but they may well be a T-shaped bar or even a spring or a compressed gas loaded mechanism. It can be all sorts of things. Um, here's a typical anti-roll bar. As you can see, it's a, a, a U-shaped torsion bar. It's attached across the chassis, and as one wheel pushes up, the other wheel, it tries to push the other wheel up and stop the vehicle rolling. The other wheel push, or pushes down, it'll push the wheel down. So it, it basically, it's a stabilizing, a stabilizing bar fitted across the chassis, front and or back. 
these things are used to adjust the understeer and oversteer in the chassis. They're also used to adjust the chassis to be more suitable for use in wet weather conditions. So if you build a car and you don't have any roll bars on it, it's quite likely the judge will say to you, so what happens if you are ready to go racing and all of a sudden it starts pouring rain? How are you going to soften up the suspension and allow the, the car to move around better to allow the water to escape from out under the tires? What you would normally do would be to soften the, the, uh, the anti-roll bars. If you want a quick tune for torque's sake, the car is understeering. To fix the understeer, you could do one of two things. You could either soften the front anti-roll bar or stiffen the rear anti-roll bar. Softening the front anti-roll bar would allow a little more grip in the front tires. Stiffening the rear and oops, do that? stiffening the what the stiffening the uh, the rear anti-roll bar would take away grip at the back. Well, nobody ever wants to take away grip, so you'd actually soften the front end of your roll bar to reduce your, uh, your, your understeer moment. A good, very good tuning aid. Okay, here we have a different sort of an anti roll bar. Uh, this is an anti roll bar that's used with a car that's got bell cranks and push rods. The bell cranks are attached to these rods up here. The anti roll bar itself is actually here, this, sh this shaft up and down here, that pivots back and forth in the chassis. So as the suspension bumps, uh, the, the suspension uh, that will just move that bar back and forth. But as the car tries to roll, as one uh, as one bell crank goes in one direction, the other bell crank goes in the other direction, it will attempt to twist this T and twist that bar, and that bar then reduces, resists, uh, resists the, um, the rolling moment of the car. Sometimes you'll see it that, in fact, this is not the, the, uh, the torsion bar, but it's actually a blade across here, which actually bends. So it's the bending, it's like a leaf spring that goes across there. Okay, uh, we talk about pitch and squat. So a car will not only roll about its roll axis, it will also pitch about its pitch axis. We see this as dive under braking and squat under acceleration. And dive and squat can be minimized by locating the CI, uh, by loca locating the center of gravity as low as possible. Now, I started to talk here about anti-dive geometry and anti-squat geometry, and I'm not going to talk about that today because I don't like it, you don't need it, and I actually am going to generate a much better and much clearer presentation that explains all this anti-dive and anti-squat stuff in a much clearer way. Um, it's sort of black magic. How the real guys do it is they introduce a third spring and shock absorber. So here we have, this is a car with push rods and bell cranks, and springs left and right. It has a T-bar type anti-roll bar and connected to the middle of the T-bar is a third spring and shock absorber. So we can have a single bump operates one spring a double bump will operate all three springs and shock absorbers together. So if the car is going to nosedive under brakes, this spring comes into account and, react and uh, uh, reacts that, uh, that diving moment and keeps the car level. That's not all that important in Formula Student because unless the car is actually diving to the point where the chassis is hitting the ground, why it's important in Indy cars and Formula One cars is they want to keep their aerodynamic uh, platform, their wings and under tray, uh, as level to the ground or in, in the correct uh, relationship to the ground as possible. They don't want it moving around. Back of the same car, same story. Again, we have a T-shaped uh, anti-roll bar pivoted down to the back of the gearbox. Here are the drive axles, here is the back of the car on this end. Two long arms that come back from the from the bell cranks that operate a coil spring and shock absorber arrangement that's compressed if the car tries to squat its backside down as the driver accelerates out of the corner. The weight transfer moves to the back, tries to overcome the rear springs. The car wants to sit down in the back uh, and uh, 
this spring here uh, reacts that stops that from, from occurring. OK, occasionally you'll come across a, a car with a water shock. It's only got a single spring. In this case, it's got the push rods that operate a an anti-roll bar in there. Uh, the water shock, the single spring and shock absorber is operated back here. Now, the anti-roll bar in this car is actually sprung. It sort of slides side to side on a uh, on a shuttle. Otherwise, the car couldn't roll at all because it, it, the whole thing would be locked up. Um, that's quite a common solution in Formula 3 cars or whatever. We, again, we don't see that very much in Formula 3 cars. OK. Um, we are at a point where I want to talk about design in the chassis. OK, what slide number are we up to? We're up to slide number. 57. OK, and I'll eventually I can take, take a break there. OK, just a, a, a few slides because I'm going to I'm going to stop this in a few minutes and um, we'll take some questions if you've got them. OK, in this discussion, we'll assume that the team intends to build a straightforward space frame car with double A arm suspension, front and rear, no tricks, no clever stuff, no, no anti dive, no anti squat, none of that nonsense. OK, I want you to imagine a 200 kilogram mass, uh, the 200 kilogram mass being the unsprung weight of the car. Unsprung weight is anything in the car that's carried on the springs. So it's the chassis, the engine, the, the, the driver, the transmission, so on and so forth, but not including the wheels, tires, brakes. They're unsprung. So the sprung mass, 200, and it's centered at the center of gravity, and a force arm extends from each center of gravity to each of the tire contact patches. This simplified example allows us to visualize the forces involved in accelerating the mass in the X and Y axes. The job that you've been given is not so much to build a little race car, but to take a mass of 250 or 300 kilograms and to accelerate it from the starting line around the track back to the starting line in the shortest amount of time and using the least amount of fuel. Uh, we're not talking about racing other cars or anything like that. And whatever you can do to achieve that makes it work better. Now, we have to accept that all the forces act through the center of gravity. OK, so we've got our four contact patch. All the forces act through the center of gravity, vertical, lateral loads and they are reacted at the contact patches at the ground. Okay. So what we have is a mass that first thing we can see is that by lowering the mass, we open this angle and we get a, a, um, a more stable platform. So this is the simplest example I can give you of how important it is to keep the center of gravity as low as possible. Now, the next one shows that your car is actually more like a sausage on legs than a than a than a big bowling ball on legs, because obviously your car is long and uh, it's not, it's not a round mass; it's a it's a long mass. But we're going to say, okay, we'll pretend that it's actually a haggis. A haggis is a Scottish sausage, a big round Scottish sausage. Now, going back to here. You can only impose so much of a lateral force on here before, first of all, your springs bottom out, and then the car tips over, falls over. Now, you can't afford to do that unless you've got quite a few drivers to use that because you're going to hurt people. You can't make the legs any longer because, unfortunately, on the track, you have these cones that you've got to get through. So we're stuck with the situation of having to build a car with as much stability as possible that will pass through the cones 
generate good grip. And another one of Pat's three rules of thumb is that all things being equal, firstly, the car with the lightest weight will win. The car with the lowest mass will always win. F equals MA, that's the way it is. Um, don't put anything in the car that doesn't have to be in there. Remember, it doesn't weigh anything, doesn't cost anything, can't break. Second thing is, all things being equal, the car with the lowest center of gravity will win. So you have to get that mass down close to the down close to the ground as much as possible. Thirdly, all things being equal, the car with the least polar moment of inertia will win. So you have to reduce the weight, lower the weight, and centralize the weight in the car if you want to build a competitive Formula student car. How do you reduce the weight? The only way I can tell you to reduce the weight is that you don't put it in in the first place. There's no point in starting with a completed car and think, oh, we'll have to drill holes and everything to make it lighter. That just plain doesn't work. Smart design means, and several iterations of design, means that uh, you know, you if, if something doesn't need to be there, it doesn't need to be there. And one of the things that doesn't need to be there are bell cranks and push rods and all that other nonsense with suspension. Um, if you can locate nodes in the chassis where you can where you can impose multiple loads, so you don't need multiple nodes, you only have simple. That makes the, the chassis simpler, more sensible, easier to easier to build, and uh, and lighter in the in the long run. Uh, lowering the center of gravity, well. That actually makes a decision. Like it, all of your design decisions should be should be actually worked around those three those three points. So, for example, if you're going to build a simple little uh, IC IC car, like a, a an internal combustion car. So, firstly, you're going to choose a battery to put in this car. So, you have the choice. Do you choose a standard lead acid battery or a, a lithium polymer battery? Um, okay, all things being equal, the car with the lowest mass will win. A lithium polymer battery weighs much, much less than a, than a lead acid battery, so you choose the lithium polymer battery. Okay, all things being equal, the car with the lowest center of gravity will win. So when you put this lithium polymer battery in the car, where do you put it? Answer, you put it on the floor down as low as possible. Third thing, all things being equal, the car with the with the, the least moment of inertia will win. So whereabouts on the floor do you put it? As close to the center of gravity as possible so that you're not waving it around in the, in the breeze. Now, if each of your design decisions is, um, is predicated on those three choices, you can't really go far wrong. The worst thing though is you don't just start throwing a car together without a proper design uh, evolution and iterations before you really start. Now, that's the what this is the slide where I was going to call it quits and say we might be a good time to take a short break and have a coffee. What I'm going to do though is it's now uh, it's now 10 past nine here. So we've been uh, we've been on the half past seven, half past eight. Yeah, so we've been on the on the air for about an hour and three quarters or something. Uh, what I might actually do is take questions, and we'll continue this another day. You happy with that? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. Well, can can somebody? Uh, oops, what have I done there? I don't have to launch the room. What I want to do. Yeah. Okay. So I'm uh, quite prepared to take questions from the audience. If anybody wants to ask me anything. Yeah. What I will do. Uh, uh, my first question is regarding what you told as uh, discarding all the bell cranks and the push rods and stuff. So yeah. at the front, it's quite easy to execute it because we don't have many components going around. But at the rear, we have a lot of components going around and it's really difficult to execute a direct actuation suspension. 
So how, how do you, or what do you propose as a way around this? Okay, what I propose, it, it actually isn't that difficult to, to do, do that at the back. What I, what I suggest you do is uh, Google pictures of Formula 2 and Formula 3 cars from the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, that, uh, that will find you, uh, because that was the standard solution uh, on on uh, many many cars back in the uh, back in the uh, in the 60s and 70s that's the way cars were built when they were building space frame cars as state of the art and they were using direct acting suspension front and back uh, it's it's not difficult at all to uh, to to have uh, sp- sp- I, I know that the difficulty that you're alluding to is having <laughs> having the coil spring and damper pass through the middle of the axle uh, you know, they get in the way of each other. But uh, in fact, you move the coil spring damper ahead of the axle or behind the axle, depending on your geometry. And it, it works. It, it, it's it's not a difficult solution at all. Go search, you'll find the solutions. Okay? Right, right, right. Good evening, sir. Yeah, go. The, uh... I have a doubt related to designing process. Like in the start, we decide, oh, sorry, but we assume our weight of the car, we assume our CG of the car, and at the end, uh, we found something else. And we don't have much time to run one more iteration. So, so what can we do now? <laughs> That's exactly what I told you happens, that you... Uh... Uh, you you start off the project. You don't have the knowledge that you really needed to have to do it. You found that you've done something wrong, and you've got. Um, t- t- tell me, uh, uh, please, can you speak just a little more slowly because the line to here is not that good. But uh, tell me, what what actual problem are we talking about? Where tell me what's actually gone wrong? So the assumed weight and assumed coordinates of CG are different the coordinates so what do you think what do you think is going if you keep if you keep building the car the way you've designed it what do you think is going to go wrong so all all the parts uh, which we have designed earlier are based on the earlier mass assumptions and cg assumption the force, all the forces are calculated according to that. And now we yeah. have found that our weight is different and our CG location is different. Yeah. So the, the parts we uh, designed earlier will be different because forces will be different this time because CG location much, is shifting. Yeah, how much different will the forces be? In, in uh, like in centimeters. Um, okay, I, I suspect that um, that uh, you you will have designed in some degree of safety, and I, I think you'll find that if you just assemble the car, it'll work just fine. Okay, but you need to get it done, and you need to test it to make sure that it works just fine, and to make sure that nothing uh, is going to break on you. Like you might have to uh, you might have to just look at a few things. Tell you tell you what to do. Uh, uh, I'll give you an email address that you can write to me at. Now, it's the world's easiest email address. It's pat.clark, that's C-L-A-R-K-E, that's just my name, at email.com. That's a real email address, okay? If you want to send me some details, if anybody wants to send me details or questions, um, I'll see if I can help you. I'm certainly not going to teach you how to design your car. That's your job. But I will try help you to avoid any of the bad pitfalls. But I would suspect that if you've done, if you've done uh, due diligence, shall we say, on on the, the the strength or or the the, the load carrying capability of certain components in the car, and then you've found that the car is heavier than you thought, and that the center of gravity is not where you thought it was going to be. In all honesty, it's probably not going to make a great deal of difference because I suspect you'll be able to tune out the effects in the car when you get it on the track and you start doing some testing. Never works perfect first time. 
OK. OK, sir, thank you. One thing I would say, if anybody wants to email me at that address, please tell me your name and what team you represent. OK. Yes, sir, sure. Yep. Any more questions? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. That you uh, talked about anti roll bars. Yeah. And uh, as our team, we have an Olin suspension which has a variable uh, damping rate with it. So, do you really think it's still necessary to include an anti roll bar in our car? Or, uh, I mean, because according to us, it'll do. Well, I mean, the, de the decision is entirely yours. But if a design judge says to you, how are you going to. Uh, how are you going to change your uh, your uh, oversteer or understeer uh, component in your car? Uh, what are you going to tell him? Well, we have an adjustable uh, spring rate and a damping rate, so I yes, think that could do. Uh, yeah, well, if, if you if you think that can do, and you think you can you can um, uh, you can convince the the judge, well, fair enough. I mean. Probably most former student cars don't have any roll bars, um, you yeah. but uh, believe me, they're 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 a good thing to have. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Next question. My good wife is bringing me a cup of coffee. That's just what I need. Any more questions? Don't be shy. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, Pat. Yep. Yeah, go. Yes. Yes. Uh, as you said that most of the teams are starting from scratch again after this COVID situation. So uh, suppose in a case of our team, we are getting a team mostly of the new records formed from mostly the new recruits. So how do yes. we start with the design process? Because no one is having an idea how to design a car. Yep. <laughs> uh, How do I answer that question? Um, I mean, every team, every team has that issue. I mean, how did you, you've obviously been? You're not the you're not the first. I guess, you know, not all of the uh, not all of the team members are brand new. So you just have to have you know, leadership where the the experienced team members will will mentor the the new team members to design the car. Um, what I would suggest to you though is keep it simple, stupid Dutch. You know. Uh, direct acting suspension, no push ruts, no pull ruts, no uh, uh, no carbon fiber, no uh, a, 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 an IC car, a, a, just a straight little petrol car, probably using a, a, a KTM 390 engine. Uh, just keep it as simple as possible. 12, uh, 13 inch wheels, not 10 inch wheels. Stay away from 10 inch wheels for beginners. Uh, the reason I say that is that um, the amount of space inside a 10 inch wheel for the suspension components you need to tuck in there and the brakes and the other steering stuff that you need to get in there. It's very limited space. So it's much easier in 13 inch wheels. And although people will argue that the 10 inch wheel is quicker, I, I don't really believe that's really the case. And as I said at the beginning, you know, fast, cheap, reliable, choose any two. Well, you know, one of the places that's going to be reliable and cheap is with 13 inch wheels. May not be fast because remember, fast is the parameter that you're going to have to. Uh, you're going to have to uh, not abandon, but you're go you're going to have to.
take uh, take a hit on because you know you're not going to be able to build a fast car with a brand new team with no experience but you can build a reliable car and that's what you should be aiming for okay thank you ben. yes thank you ben. any more questions uh, this was uh, regarding the tires. So you talked about the 13 inch and the 10 inch tires. And uh, yeah. my question regards the uh, data that we get for the tires. So there's very little data available with us for the tire, even when we get to the TTC data. Uh, there's little to nothing that, that we can do with that data. So how do you suggest we can come up with some, uh, say, substantial data through where we can validate our uh, vehicle dynamics geometry? Um, I would let, let's talk about uh, Formula One at the moment. You know, tires are a big deal in Formula One. Uh, you watch Formula One? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Remember, there's a race on tonight. Um, very soon, actually. Um, how much data do you think those teams have on those uh, Pirelli tires, bearing in mind that they have I don't know, maybe nine or ten different variations on the tire, and they change them from event to event, and sometimes they even change the construction halfway through the year. Um, realistically, you put the tire on the car, and then you tune the tire to make the best value of it. You know, uh, the idea—the idea that oh, you need the tire data. You, honestly, you don't need the tire data. Um, it, uh, you know, the tire, the, the tire data is flawed. It's look, it's useful stuff, and it certainly would be useful stuff if you wanted to go work for a tire company or for, you know, a, I guess a vehicle manufacturing company or whatever. But the tire data is only, uh, only valuable, or only, only uh, relates to brand spanking new tires tested on a flat track machine in New York State. That's very different to use tires uh, on, uh, on, on the Bud circuit goat track that we know it is uh, in, uh, in uh, Noida. That's not, that's not the same, same thing at all. So as soon as you, as soon as you, um, you make some decisions regarding camber, caster, toe, pressures, all the other things, you take it to the track and instantly you start adjusting all those things, the camber, the caster, the toe, the tire pressures, you start adjusting all those things, which means that effectively you've thrown the knowledge that the tire data supposedly gave you straight out the window by adapting the tires to the situation that you've got at the moment. So that's what you do. Like you, you, you know, t teams come to me and they say, oh, we can't afford the tire data. What should we do? And I say to them, just look at the, at the, uh, the what tire the majority of teams use because they've got the tire data. They've made the decision. Just copy that. Do that. What tires are you guys using? Use the Hoosier uh, uh, thirteen-inch tires. Yeah, keep keep using them. Yeah. So how how exactly as a design judge do you expect the team to validate our decision? Well, you explain to the tire judge that you cannot do that for all the reasons that you can't do it. And so that you validated your, you know, you made you made a, a pragmatic decision based on, on what the majority of teams were using and uh, and then tuned the car to suit that decision to make the, make the best of that decision on the track. Because bluntly, that's what the judge would do. You know, that's, uh, and, and most forms of motorsport these days anyway, you don't have any choice on tires. It's not as if it's not as if you can sit down and uh, and choose. You know, like oh, we'll go to the tire. Are we going to use Avons or Pirellis or Bridgestones or Michelins or Dunlops or what are we going to find? No, you find that you're going to race Formula Three. Guess what? They're going to run on hand cooked tires out of Korea. There you go. That's what you're running. Oh, okay. So then you use the tires and you develop the, the tire and, and the car. Adjust the car to make the best use of those tires on the track with your driver in your event. And that's what you do with your 13 inch users. Nothing wrong with 13 inch users.
Right. Right. Now, what there's something else I'm talking about here uh, that you might have missed, and that is that it's important for you to take some control of the discussions that you're having with the judges. Don't be over polite and allow the judge to totally dominate the, the discussion. You are entitled to your point of view. You are entitled to make your, to make your, uh, I mean, the judge is always going to play what's called the devil's advocate. If you've got 13 inch tires, he's going to say, hey, why don't you have 12, 10 inch tires? If you've got a space frame shows, he's going to say, hey, why don't you have a, a, a carbon fiber monocoque? If you've got an electric car, why aren't you running IC? If you've got an IC car, why aren't you running electric or hybrid? The judge always will present the opposite scenario to get you to justify the decision that you've you've made before you present your car to him. Um, he knows all, all he's trying to do is to make you to make you struggle and make you justify. So the justification for using for using the the, the use your tires would be that based on your experience and, and on uh, uh, what you can see, uh, the Hoosier 13 inch tire was the best tire to suit your to suit your um, uh, your situation. Um, you weren't able to use the um, the tire data because it didn't relate to the situation in India, and so you've chosen to go with uh, with who's your 13 inch tire based on this performance that you've observed at other events on other cars, and you are going to adapt or adjust the car and the driver to make the best of your tire choice. How can he argue with that? What's wrong with that logic? Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a, uh, it, 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 sometimes the, uh, I find the Indian teams are just a little bit too polite, um, and it's a lovely thing. But sometimes you got to stand up, you know, you got to fight for your right to party, or whatever it was the song says. You know, like you, you, uh, you know, you made the decision. Tell the judge why you made the decision. Why did you make the decision? Because you saw the tires operating on other cars. You thought they're the tires to have. You can get them. There's a. a problems with the, with acquiring quality race tires in India. We know that. They cost an arm and a leg. Uh, there's difficulties with uh, with import duties and all sorts of things. So it's not like a, a judge is going to, to come from uh, the UK and say, hey, why aren't you using Avons? Or he comes from Italy, he says, why aren't you using Pirellis? Or he comes from the States and says, why aren't you using Goodyear's or Hoosier's? Hey, you're in India. Use the best you can get. The best you could get was Hoosier. And I would actually say to the judge, next question, but move along. Talk about something something else. Right. Okay. Be tough. Okay. Anyone else got questions? Come on, I'm easy to talk to. So can we test our car on relation games like Asset or Corsa? Can you repeat that? I didn't hear what you said. Sir, can you test? Can we test our car uh, virtually on games like Assetto Corsa? Well, like the results uh, are reliable well, or not? Of, of course you can. But what what value do you get from that? I mean, what what do you think is is the relationship between a software model? Uh, you know, run on a run on a computer, and the actual real world. You know, simulation is okay, but it doesn't replace the real testing, um, because uh, yeah, because it's 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 only a, a virtual a virtual world. You you can you know you can certainly test your car on a set of course or whatever, but that's really you're just playing games. Um, you know, when you get to the real world and the rubber meets the road and, and all of a sudden you start to introduce G forces and things that uh, road forces, things that you don't really get in in the computer simulations. Um, and then the suspension breaks or 
the steering brakes or the driver gets tired or, or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, you know, that you can't simulate those things in a, in a, in a computer game. So, but sure, you can, you, can, uh, you can test the viability, I guess, of your model on a computer game, but uh, I don't know that a judge is going to be too impressed if he asks, how did you assess that such and such a solution was the best solution by saying we modeled it in a computer game? Okay. So can you suggest something for like testing our car and analyzing it? Um, or virtually so is, everything virtually. Okay. Is, is your car finished? Is your car? Yes, is the design car, is complete. No, but the car is not finished. You? No, no. Okay. Because you, I mean, you can't test until the car is finished. That's why it is hugely important to get the car finished at least a month before the event, because you must test it. And I promise you, it will break. And you'll find other things like the driver after four laps, the driver will come in and say, I can't sit and this is killing my back or the brake pedal. I keep I keep hitting the, the accelerator when I put the brakes on or all sorts of funny little things are going to happen. The steering is too heavy um, or whatever. And those things you have to fix, you know, the, the car is not stable under brakes. You have to figure out why. So those things you have to fix and you can't do them until such time as the car is finished. Um, so get the car finished and get it to a testing venue somewhere. I know it's hard, but you need to find somewhere where you can test it. Um, you know, it's, uh, but how can we do it virtually? You can't. Like anything well, we can. Well, no, because as I said before, you're actually you're really only playing games. It's um, you know your simulation. The car the car is not finished, and the car is not. Um, it's not in a. Uh, it's not in a condition that uh, that you can actually evaluate because until you do evaluate the real car, that's when you're going to find out what what happens if you evaluate that you you assess your car in in a simulation program, then you put the car on the track and you find it is absolutely, totally a pig understeer car that you just can't get around the corners. But it worked perfectly in the simulation. Now it doesn't work in the real world. Well, what are you going to do? All your simulation was worthless, wasted. And those things happen. You know? you know, yes, I, sir. If you if you gather that uh, uh, I'm not a great uh, fan of simulated testing, you got it right. I'm not. You must you know, put off the fun bit. See, the other thing that happens is the fun bit. You you build a model in a set of Corsa or whatever the hell it is, and then everybody starts playing, and all of a sudden you're too busy playing bloody games on the computer and not getting on with building your car. Oh, shit, we should go put those wheels on, shouldn't we? Yeah, we'll do it tomorrow. We have another race on here. Let's keep, you know, don't get distracted. Keep yes, your mind right. on the job. I know, I know uh, it's fun playing on the computer, <laughs> but there, there is the need for, uh, for, for focus, focus on what you're doing. Yeah. If we're trying to, um, if we're trying to prepare you for life after college, and you're working for a job, and uh, the, the boss gives you a job to design something, and he comes back a couple of weeks later and says, "What are you doing?" And you say, "Oh, I'm just uh, we're just simulating it on the computer to see how it all works." He's not going to be very happy. They get on and build the bloody thing I asked you to do. All right. I don't think there's too much else I can say to you. Okay, Hello. I'm listening, drink, drinking yes, my uh, coffee and listening. Also, yeah. also, with now Formula Imperial being announced, uh, there are a number of competitions being uh, held in India as well. So what would you suggest to the teams that the number of competi competitions the team must participate in or the least amount of competition? Yeah, look, uh, um, I, I only at this point have any great respect for just two competitions. 
and that's Bharat and Imperial. Um, Ari, you run those two, and, and so one's in the south of the country, one's in the north of the country. Um, and uh, but you know, Supra, I'm not a fan of Supra. Um, I've seen some stuff. You know, when, when we just when when we were asked to be involved with Supra a few years ago, and then we discovered that we we're actually wheel to wheel racing and all sorts of horrible things going on. And we're not in the business of having to send somebody's son home in a wooden box because we kill them on a track that's Formula student is not about racing, not about wheel to wheel racing. You know, that's why we limit the performance of the car by by the number of chicanes on the track, by arranging the track so that the runoff areas are so safe, uh, by uh, having a maximum uh, limit on the power output, the voltage on the electric cars, or the 20 millimeter restrictor on the IC cars, because we have a duty of care to look after you guys. You know, it's. Uh, we can't just turn you loose because we know what happens. You know, we'll end up, and and we do see it happen because we see accidents happen when students drive the cars outside the event. You know, we had a driver in Scotland very nearly killed when they took a car to a racetrack, at, took off the restrictors. The driver was not a very skilled driver, lost control and crashed into a fence. And as far as I know, he is still this was about three or four years ago, he is still handicapped uh, from the head injuries that he suffered. Now, of course, those things, we hope, don't happen at events where, the, where, where we have control to, to look after your, you know, I, I see the boss is looking here very pensive, uh, thinking, you know, we have, as organizers or, or mentors, we have a duty of care to look after you kids. That's why we yell at you when you go grinding with that uh, uh, eye protection on or welding without the right goals. We, you know, we we are we are actually looking after your health. So uh, that was one of the reasons why I was not impressed by Supra. So I know that Barat has run to a to a very high standard, probably because I'm involved with it, and now I'm sure that uh, Imperial will be run to an equally high standard, if not higher. You're nodding and smiling, boss. <laughs> yeah. But what I'm saying is correct, isn't it? Yeah, that's 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 perfectly okay. And uh, uh, from my side, if you if you see, then uh, the choice uh, happens to be from the student side. But nowadays, what is happening is that uh, uh, students are also thinking of cost benefit, right? So if you are going for a, a large scale or a international kind of uh, event then in that case uh, shelling out money is going to be a big problem for you all maybe you are not able to get the sponsorship and all and ultimately the project fails uh, yeah. basically basically this is uh, see there, there are three things in the project one is quality another is time and the cost so any one of these will be responsible for disaster in the project and uh, if if you are considering these three in a in a in a uh, proper way, I don't think uh, you will uh, find any issue in that. And accordingly, you choose the event anyway. Do the best in one of the event. Do the best. And once Great. you are done with that, uh, maybe you can participate in some other event uh, where you can fetch maybe potential another prize. Uh, and you can you can have some kind of cost bearing on your vehicle. Uh, so maybe one good project and then you are going for it. Remember always this project, what you are doing, it is not for racing. Please, that is the secondary thing. It is most of the time learning. Yep. It's a real time learning. That's what uh, Mr. Clark is also deliberating on. Yes, yep. sir. What, what I was going to say is, and I'd like the students to listen to what I'm going to tell them. There is money in, in India. You just have to find it, okay? <laughs> um, now, the very first thing is to follow on what you've just been told. Do not represent yourselves as the Delhi University racing team. Drop the word racing completely and absolutely out of it. There isn't a, a, a marketing manager for any company of any size out there who doesn't get applications come across his desk every day. Dear sir, 
please give me some money to spend on my racing machine, my car, my boat, my motorbike, or whatever the case may be. And that marketing manager says, what's in that for me? Nothing. And it goes straight into the bin. In fact, it doesn't even get to the marketing manager. It gets to the marketing manager's secretary. And she makes the decision about, does the boss need to see this or not? And it goes in the bin. When you present yourself, present yourselves as students representing your university in an international engineering competition, competing against universities, some 700 universities from all over the world. And you're representing the University of Delhi in this, in this competition. Now, there are several benefits here. Firstly, there's the good neighbor thing. The, the, there's the thought that, oh, that's a good thing. We should be supporting students and, and whatever, and we should be supporting India on the, on the global stage. The second thing is, and you don't think about this, but it might well be that there's a tax break in this for the guy if he gives you some money. He may be able to write this off on his taxation, and it doesn't cost him very much at all. The second thing that I'll tell you is don't send emails or messages or, or, or notes or whatever the case may be. You need to identify potential sponsors, potential sponsor companies, and then you need to uh, uh, um, approach those companies and make an appointment to see the man, to see the, the, uh, the marketing manager or the sales manager or the engineering manager or whoever, whoever it is that you need to see. And when you sit down in front of him, let me tell you this. If you look somebody in the eye and you ask for help, legitimate help, to do a project which is worthwhile and your project is worthwhile, it is almost impossible for him to say no. His personality, his loss of face will not allow him to say no. Now, he may not be able to give you what you ask for. It might well be that he says, look, I'm sorry, I have absolutely no money in my budget to do this, but he will want to save face. So he may then say something like, but I tell you what, I can organize for you to borrow one of my trucks to take your car to the event or something similar. Okay, so as I said, the, the human nature and, and the loss of face means that when you, when you find the right person and you ask them respectfully to help you in a quality uh, project, it is almost impossible for them to say no. Would you agree, boss? Yeah, I, I totally agree uh, with you. And uh, it's a fabulous pitch you have given to the students. Uh, means uh, uh, you have done two things today. One is uh, you have given deliberations on suspension and formula car. And another one is how to get money. So this is something <laughs> amazing. That's that's great, sir. That's great. Yeah. Yes. OK. So if, well, you, if you, yeah, please go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say we must be getting near time to wind up. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, any any other question? Maybe we can take the last question now. Please unmute and uh, ask the question if if anybody wants to ask. So this is yeah. pertaining to uh, the whole competition and the scenario being virtual because uh, pandemic is preventing a lot of colleges from reopening and a lot of students from accessing the workshops in their respective colleges. So it becomes really difficult to actually fabricate the car that we're designing. So how good is it uh, if, if a bunch of engineers get together and uh, they actually design a car on, on the ca computer as a CAD? And, and I completely share your opinion being from the batch that actually designed a car and actually fabricated it, that it's, it's no more than playing games. But how, how good is it uh, from the point of view of a judge? <laughs> I've seen some wonderful CAD designs, absolutely beautiful stuff. Um, that was another thing with Supra that uh, they had their virtual event and I saw some wonderful designs. And then when they went to, to build a car, like we've seen over the years uh, that you get, you get from the team their, their uh, eight page design report that they submit and they've got all the stuff about their car. And then you look at the car and you think, hang on a minute. This, how, how am I going to identify this car from this design report? It is totally different. It's got all these lovely design pictures and various things, and the car that's been presented is, is nothing like it. 
Um, so um, at the American competition, one of the things that we started was a competition for the best design drawings, um, because we found that in many cases, uh, the, the drawings were either poor quality or didn't represent the car that was presented. But when the senior design judge just saw good quality drawings, like engineering quality drawings, uh, that actually truthfully rep represented the car that was presented and would have allowed us to actually build that car, should we wish, then we actually, we did a deal with Bosch uh, to, uh, to, present, uh, to present some Bosch product to the, uh, uh, to, to the teams that, that actually won that. It was another little, another little part of the um, of the of the uh, the competition um the Bosch people liked it because they said that they published so many uh technical documents yearly that they were always crying out for quality uh, uh quality like graphic designers and um, and illustrators <laughs> so they you know again it was a matter of of finding the right sponsor and presenting them with a with a solution or with a, with a with a project that would that, that attracted them Yay. Um, one funny little story I'll tell you before before I go. Um, Claude Ruel, I'm sure most of the students on here will know Claude. Claude and I looked at a car in England some years ago, and it was made from black steam pipe. And the students told us that's when I discovered that the word for pipe and the word for tube in, in India was the same and that there was difficulty. But the students said to us that, oh no, it is not possible to buy a good quality steel tube in India. Now straight away, I know that's a lie because the Tata Steel Company makes some of the best tube in the world. And in most countries in the world, when you go buy steel tube, it comes from Tata in India. Anyway, I said to the student, well, do they make bicycles in India? And he said, oh, yes, sir, they make millions of bicycles every year in India. I said, so what do they make bicycles out of? And he said, ah, oh, so we should get some old bicycles and cut them up and use the tube. Now, that pointed out to me something, like it sounds funny and we laugh at it, but it's not funny. What it showed was that the, 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 the student had never been trained or taught to look outside the square. Like what I was going to ask him to think was, well, where do you think the bicycle factories get their tube from? Go find the supplier. But no, he just couldn't think any bigger than oh, the bicycle, the tube and the bicycle. So we'll get some old bicycles and we'll cut them up and use that. that no, that's not what I wanted at all. The other thing along the same style of thinking is that at every event in India that I've been to, I still see teams working on the floor in the dirt. Auto rickshaw mechanics fix their auto rickshaws on the side of the road in the dried cow shit in the dirt with their tools scattered around. Engineers do not. Engineers work in clean, tidy conditions. Um, you know, so your workshop needs to be clean. It needs to be light. It needs to be well ventilated. It needs to be secure. You don't work in the crap on the floor with your tools spread around. That's not how you do it. Okay? That's... Um, uh, Peter Jones, or Dr. Peter Jones, who's one of the judges at uh, Bharat, he attended one of the universities in India uh, not that long ago to see a, uh, uh, an, an invalid carriage or an invalid, uh, like a mobile, a mobile wheelchair thing that they were designing there. And he was horrified that here's this project from the university and the students are working on a dirt floor, basically in the crap, you know, that, that, that is, you know, if you're, going, you've got, if, if you're going to be engineers, you've got to think like engineers, you've got to act like engineers, you've got to behave yourself like engineers. Engineers don't get dirty. Well, maybe they get a little bit dirty, but uh, that's, that's not how you work. You have to, and it starts off like in, with a new team, make sure that you're working, that your working conditions are, are quality. Um, you know, it, clean up, tidy up. Same thing when you present a car, like we see dirty cars presented. It costs nothing for you know a couple of people to go over a car with a rag and and uh, and some some 
cleaner or whatever to clean it up and take take the muck off or put a bit of paint on it, uh, that costs you nothing. You know, you, sh- you know, you should have pride not just in your product, but also in your workmanship and how you go about it, where you're working, the people that you're working with. And if team members are not prepared to play by those rules, find new team members. That's enough. Right. So thank you so much uh, for your uh, uh, deliberations. And uh, now this is the time uh, we are winding it up. So now I wish if uh, uh, ISI representative can take it over. Uh, Ms. Saloni, if you can uh, announce what you wanted to announce and uh, give a vote of thanks. Yes, sir. So actually, uh, firstly, I want to ask that when we'll conduct the half of the webinar. Is it on next day or um, next? Whenever you are gonna, whenever you want it to run, I'll I'll do it. Whenever you want it done, we will mail you regarding that. Then. And yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, really, we are very thankful for our Formula Imperial 2022. And yep. with your efforts, or I can say terms, Formula teams will get more inspiration to make a reliable Formula vehicle. So thank yep. you everyone for too. thank you everyone for present. As I said, uh, uh, formula in India is unfinished business for me. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's right. So, all the team members running the half of the webinar, right? About time and all. Okay, so thank you so much, everyone, and uh, thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, it's so nice to interact with you again. <laughs> and you. Thank you. That's right. So we can leave the meeting now. Yes, yep. sir, for sure. Okay, thank you and bye. Bye bye. I'll see you all again next week or when whenever we organize the, the, the second part of this presentation. Yeah. Okay, sure. Good sure. night. And I'm Good going night. to I'm Good. going to go watch thank the sprint race at Monza. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be on okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye. And don't bye. forget bye. that email address, pat.clark at email.com. If you've got questions, just fire them off to me. Um, but make sure you tell me who you are and what team you represent. Okay. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. bye.